for a conversation about mining big data, please welcome Eric Levkovsky, the founder and CEO of Tempest, and Atlantic staff writer James Hamblin. Hello. Uh, so this, uh, that's a really great intro to what we're going to talk about. We're really fortunate uh, to be joined by Eric, who is sort of a polymath uh, with a, a, a great business background. He started a little something called Groupon. We'll talk about that. And now uh, he's into big data and cancer. So can you give us a kind of brief overview of what your current project, or what this company is? Yeah, so, so Tempest is focused on um, ushering in precision medicine by basically trying to fix the underlying data infrastructure in cancer, which essentially means we have to combine large amounts of phenotypic, morphologic, and molecular data, or clinical data and molecular data together to try to figure out um, who are these patients, you know, how are they being treated, what drugs are they taking, how are they responding to those drugs, and then why. Is there some molecular profile that gives light to people that are having a super response or a super non-response? And so we're, really the way to think about Tempest is trying to build the underlying data backbone that would make precision medicine uh, real at scale. Okay, and so um, what's unique about the way you're thinking about this is that you're kind of uniting things that a lot of different people in the precision medicine space are doing individually or in silos, is that right? Yeah, you, I mean, so Tempest is like the, an amalgamation of multiple different um, companies or components. So um, historically, there were people that were focused on structuring clinical data. There were people that were focused on generating large amounts of molecular data, predominantly genomic data. There were companies focused on using uh, machine learning and some early form of artificial intelligence to mine that data. Tempest is really maybe the first company doing all, all of those at scale. Uh, and, at a, and, a, and at a scale that at least historically um, you know, hasn't been achieved in that, I think we work with something like 52 of the 69 NCI cancer centers, about 200 hospital systems on top of that. And so uh, we work with ASCO um, and CancerLink, and so we have about one in four, 25% of all cancer patients in the U.S. now come through Tempest in some way, shape, or form, where we're either structuring their clinical data or um, sequencing them or loading their data onto our database. Okay. So you don't have the traditional MD, PhD background. You have uh, law and business background. You started Groupon. You started other successful companies. How does that inform the way that you're, um, you've even taught a course called Disruptive Business? Uh, yeah, okay. um, yeah it, um, or maybe, maybe disruptive technologies, but yeah. um, you know, I spent my entire life, uh, at least the last 20 years, um, basically structuring unstructured, messy data and trying to bring technology to industries that have not had a lot of technology. So we've done that in um, printing, logistics, local commerce, uh, media buying, manufacturing, and I never thought I would uh, be in healthcare, but about four years ago, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer, and I found myself spending a bunch of time in a clinic, and I was just perplexed at how little data had permeated her care. And it was crazy to me that we were, you know, providing all this technology to other industries, uh, but it hadn't found its way yet into cancer care or healthcare more broadly. And so about a little over three years ago, we started Tempest to try to solve that problem. And now there's something like uh, close to 600 people. We had, I think, 10 a week or something, um, all focused on you know, genomicists, bioinformaticians, um, data scientists, uh, computational biologists, all trying to find a way to basically solve this historically unsolved problem. Yeah, and so but how does your success in business sort of inform the, your approach here and, and now? It's something you learned from, from Groupon or from another project that you said, this is not happening in the, in the cancer space. Yeah. Why? I mean, I think, you know, we, we kind of have developed uh, an expertise, or I've developed an expertise at um, really bringing technology to spaces that don't have a lot of technology. And so my, the part of my past that I think is so relevant to healthcare is that this is a space that historically, um, for lots of good reasons, rejected technology. Um, but with the uh, dramatic reduction in the cost of generating molecular data and the number of clinical trials, publications, FDA-approved drugs that were now tied to these molecular um, therapies, the, the underlying system, at least in cancer, from a clinical decision support perspective, began to break. And for the first time ever, around the time Tempest was born, you had 
um, physicians in mass saying, I need help, I need systems to help me uh, analyze and synthesize all this data so I can make the best decision for my patient. And um, so the part of my background that's most relevant is that that's, that's what I've spent my whole career doing, or at least the last 20 years. Yeah, and you've had great success so far in getting a lot of patients enrolled, a big data set. How are you, how do you conceptualize like the idea of getting people to buy into this, to feel comfortable with it, to um, want to participate rather than want to hoard their data? And not yeah, we, 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 don't, uh, we don't deal with patients really at all. We focus in entirely on dealing with physicians and um, really across the entire spectrum of academic medical centers to, 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 the, to the community. And um, it's, it's really what, what I think is what, what's been so surprising, at least for me, when we started Tempest three years ago, I would have thought maybe a couple of academic medical centers or, or big hospital systems would have come on board, but the adoption has just been uh, really unbelievable with all these people that historically have not wanted to contribute their clinical data um, that are all in mass saying, you know, here Tempest, you can, you can uh, have this data in order to, to use it to find aggregated insights that make the entire community smarter. And the, the challenge is you have to, um, one of the challenges we had to get over at Tempest was not just would people give us their data, but could we find a sustainable way to structure and cleanse that data? Because the data is largely unstructured. It's either in free form text, you know, physician progress notes, pathology reports, radiology reports, or it's in images that are not structured. And so um, a, a lot of the public efforts where they've had a problem is that there's just no money to structure this data, nor is there an incentive. So Tempest has built a business model around structuring that data and being able to support that in a sustainable way. So we can go through this data, look for all those key phenotypic patterns, sequence patients, and then find the match. So you're talking about big academic centers being generous and contributing, and you weren't expecting that, that you thought that they, they might not want to share. And um, so why do you think they're doing that? Is it they simply don't know what to do with the data? Is it generosity of spirit no. or why? I mean, if there is a business incentive in this, yeah. um, why do people not hoard and, and hold I think on? historically when people went to big community hospital systems or academic medical centers and said, hey, will you give us your data or let us um, you know, do something with your patients, the, the question that's always asked at an institutional level is what value am I getting in return? Um, what's the trade? And the Tempest offered a significant amount of value in that we had this platform to both structure that data and then provide insights, you know, real-time clinical decision support insights back to those physicians and also help the people doing research do better research, help drug companies make better drugs, help payers pay for the right stuff. And so that value proposition reached a point where people felt like, okay, I'm getting something of value in return and so I'm happy to contribute data, I'm happy to have you sequence my patients, I'm happy to work with you to solve some of these problems. And so I think historically, um, you know, in, in most industries, you get, you get adoption of new technologies when that value equation is there, and when you, you are offering something in return that allows change to occur, because change is, is never easy or pleasant. And so you can't talk people into changing. You have to actually create a motivation and incentive to want to do something different. And I think for whatever reason, um, Tempest got lucky or, or, or had the right um, equation. And so in mass, we began to get adoption. So I initially thought I wanted to ask you about time management because you have had so much success doing so many different things. But you're saying right now and for the last two to three years, you've been working solely and entirely on this. Yeah. So you're really pouring your heart and soul into this project. What is your long-term vision here and what is the time scale for getting to it? Yeah, I came to, uh, Tempest was started um, like late September of about three years ago and I came to work there full-time in November. I took, I was, had a commitment I had to get out of. So since November, so for the last three years is really all I've done. And I can really only do one thing at a time. I can't um, focus on uh, more than one thing. And, and this is such a huge problem that um, I don't know how long this will take to solve. I think we've made more progress in three years than, um, than we would have thought and maybe more progress than has been made to date. But it's a, it's a long journey. I mean, it's, it's going to take 
um, years and years before we feel like we have the entire system really wired up. Because part of the issue, one of the hurdles we've had to get over is not just will people give us their data, but can we get the data flowing in real time so that when um, the data comes to a place like Tempest, or in our case Tempest, and we analyze that data and, and find those patterns, we can communicate that back to the treating physician in, in, in an appropriate manner. So it's a little bit like, I mean, it, it's gonna sound crazy, but it's a little bit like, a, I feel like I'm a cable company, wiring up, like going to neighborhoods that have never had cable, and just what you may not remember, wiring yeah, no uh, idea. <laughs> Well, I remember, um, you know, I, rem I literally remember, you know, one day they just started tearing up our street and somebody laid cable and then you had a bunch of television stations. And I feel like that's the stage Tempest is at. We're laying the cable to every hospital system in the country uh, so that um, we can communicate in real time and get the data flowing. Um, we started in cancer. We're, we're moving into diabetes and depression now. Uh, we'll go to cardiovascular disease and immunology and infectious disease next year. Um, but, um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of just background work that has to be done just to get the data flowing in real time. Yeah. And that's the stage we're at. Okay. Um, and so this tends to be, I mean, the, you're talking about solving all kinds of major diseases for the entire population. It, it's a, uh, sounds like a wonderful aspiration, but it's also hard to sort of even wrap your head around. Is there an example of something an area, a specific tumor, a specific mutation where you think this approach is particularly well exemplified in, in its potential? Yeah, I mean, so we're not trying to cure all disease. I mean, I certainly hope that's the outcome. But the, again, the stage we're really at is trying to get all the data in one place, get the right data at scale in one place. That, that, that's a manageable um, a feat. Um, what we do with this data, let's just take cancer, forget the other disease types. I, I believe, and this is unproven, but it's a, a hypothesis that if we possessed structured clinical and molecular data for every cancer patient in the US, we would route them to the right therapeutic and could probably reduce about 100,000 mortalities a year. 600,000 people die of cancer a year. And so I think with data, routing people to the right drug, uh, you can reduce about um, one-sixth of those deaths. There are micro examples that are super powerful. Um, you know, for example, just in the last year or so, um, we've embedded a whole litany of immunotherapy markers into our panels where we check for things like tumor mutational burden, microsatellite instability. <clears throat> when you find a patient who's MSI high, they're eligible for a series of drugs that are having really profound impact. Um, same thing if you find a patient that's highly expressive of PDL1, they might go on an anti PDL1 drug and have a, a, a remarkably positive impact. So just being able to find these, um, you, know, you know, kind of onco targets for which there's a therapy, being able to find a particular biomarker that would lead somebody to a clinical trial, being able to find an indication that sends somebody to an immunotherapy that historically didn't exist, each of these has uh, material benefits to patients. And we, there's a whole litany of studies as to how material those benefits are. But we, if you look at the totality of that literature, it's, it's somewhere between 20 and 40% of patients will have durable long-term benefits given this kind of profiling. And what we see, because we do such exhaustive profiling, and what Tempest does is we, not just, we don't just sequence patients' genome or look at their somatic variants, we also do germline every time, all, in, all, in all instances, or virtually all instances. And then we do full transcriptomic sequencing. So we, we span both DNA and RNA and structure their clinical data and combine all that into one kind of synthesized report. And so uh, we often find that we're able to kind of point people to a therapeutic um, in, in a far greater, uh, you, know, uh, you know, way than, than others. So I think it has, it, it, it's producing significant benefits today in, in a clinical setting and that will likely only go up. Yeah. You ever worry that you're not ambitious enough? I'm, uh, is there a uh, question from the audience? Oh, something burning that I'm forgetting to ask. There's one right here. They're coming with a microphone. Oh, okay. We'll get there eventually. <laughs> All right. Given how important this data is, what is your opinion of Sloan Kettering 
giving exclusive rights to 25 million tissue samples and associated pathology information. And is that a trend we can expect to see from major cancer centers? I mean, I was pleased to hear that Dana Farber is doing Count Me In and making that data available. It's the antithesis of what Sloan Kettering just did. And how is that going to affect all of us? So I think in general, the, the challenge is um, the data is quite expensive to structure and cleanse. And so, um, you know, I don't blame people who cut exclusive deals, um, and I don't blame people who give the data publicly. Our approach at Tempest has been, when we sequence a patient or when we structure your data, in all instances, we give that raw data back to the provider 100% of the time. So you get back the BAM files or VCF files so that these academic medical centers can do research. So we leave behind, in, in essence, the seeds that we hope will lead to all kinds of good stuff, including research. Um, we also don't like exclusive deals. Uh, we prefer that the academic medical centers in particular that we work with and the community practices can use other people to sequence. We don't care at all. Our attitude is if we're not the best out there in terms of sequencing and structuring data and generating insights, you should use somebody else. Um, so I think, and so I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, I'm in favor of that approach, which is create low cost solutions that produce enormous value and give the data back to people. If people then choose to contribute that data publicly to, to efforts like uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas or uh, Genie or other uh, public efforts, great. If they choose to keep that data and use it for um, internal intellectual property purposes or to do their own research or for publications, that's fine too. The bigger issue is sustainability at scale. And where I think some of the efforts have historically failed is that they've, they've, they've wanted people to contribute data and structure data and do all kinds of great stuff with data without creating that economic incentive. But I, yeah, I mean, the, the big exclusive deals that have gotten some negative publicity, I would assume there'll be fewer of those in the future because of the negative publicity. Eric, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. For the work thank you. you. Thank you all.